In the fall of 2002, I had the lucky position to realize the Web 2.0 revolution was about to begin. Essentially, we were going to move from the information age, how you might describe Web 1.0 and earlier media technologies, to the network age. The information age is about broadcasting and finding information. The network age is about identities and networks of trust, framing information. The information age treats content as primary. The network age treats relationships as primary, where those relationships become the conduit and the interpretation of the information. Obviously, information is still critical in the network age. But what started changing was the way that you broadcast, discover, and consume information. I decided to lean all the way into Web 2, and I decided that you know, that would be the last decade of my life. I invested in entrepreneurs uh, doing the social side of the revolution, the social experiences that you get, for example, from you know, photo sharing and games and birthdays and all these other social gestures that we're all very familiar with, and that's been well covered. But I decided to dedicate my life and my work in the last decade to how the network age transforms the world of work and what it means that we, you know, how we can navigate the world differently, and that, which is why I started LinkedIn. I saw the transition as something that could create new possibilities for each individual, work to work, each individual professional to work better, from daily activities to managing the career. But at the same time, the network age has also introduced challenges that every professional has to grapple with. You see, there's a story for many decades running that we tell ourselves and we tell our children about how a career works in America. The job market for educated wor workers, the story goes, functions like an escalator. After graduating from college, you get an entry-level job at the bottom of an escalator at a company like IBM, G, Goldman Sachs. You are groomed and mentored, given professional development, opportunities, and you are whisked up on this escalator. Frequently at the same company, not always. Eventually clearing room for the next wave of college graduates to come in and start their own path on the escalator. And so long as you play nice and well, you move steadily up the escalator, each step brings with it more income, power, and job security. It's rather like the Milton Bradley game of life, if any of you have played that. There's just one problem with this story of the career escalator. It's no longer true. It's not true because a network world is a globally competitive world, and we've seen this in persistent unemployment numbers. Today, Youth unemployment is at the highest level since World War II, and the trend line is even worse. The fast-moving, interconnected world has displaced the career ladder. It has jammed the escalator. We need a new map. The new map is a network. We're not climbing a ladder or riding an escalator. We're traveling multidimensional, interconnected networks. Your network is what connects you to different opportunities. When I first thought about this in 2002, I started LinkedIn to be the relevant technology platform. Over the years, I've realized that people need more than a software tools, more than a software platform to navigate the new career space. They need the right conceptual framework. And I've been thinking about what this conceptual framework should be. I believe that it should be be the entrepreneur of your own life. It may seem somewhat surprising because entrepreneurs are stereotyped as lone wolves, pioneers, as individuals separate from society, groups, or even you know, existing companies. But in fact, and in contradiction, entrepreneurs start companies by building networks, networks of employees, networks of customers, financiers, partners, advisors, and so on. And just as company entrepreneurs have always built networks in order to build their companies, individuals now need to build, build networks to build their companies. Individuals now need to build networks for their careers, for their work life. 
As an entrepreneur builds a company, you build a network. In a sense, your network is a virtual company, the group of people around you who help you with your work. This harkens back to the lexical origin of the word company, which in Latin means literally break bread together. And to be the entrepreneur of your own life, you need to break bread with the people in your network. Today, because of the network age, because we can have this network of connections around us, you, an individual can become the entrepreneur of their own life and can have this virtual company around them, helping them with what they're doing. Now, when I see networks, I don't mean networking. I don't mean follow up with someone after you get a business card. I don't mean you know, introduce yourself, well, as we just did, to someone new right, at a conference. I'm talking about a deeper understanding of what it means to live and work in a network world. It's said when architects walk through buildings, they see ceiling ornamentation. They see structure, design. When psychologists work, walk through an office, they see behavior and lots of people trying to cope with childhood issues. <laughs> when I engage with the world, I see networks. I know I sound like the little boy from The Sixth Sense. I don't see dead people, <laughs> but I do see networks. I see networks of people coordinating and collaborating, sharing experiences, sharing information. This is one of the reasons why investing in Web2 made so much sense to me. I never see a person by themselves. When I first met Jeff Wiener, I'd already formed a networked image of him. I had talked with James Slavin and others. I had a sense of who he worked with, who trusted him, what the, the shape of the network around them. Already before I met him, I knew I wanted to build a relationship. That's part of having a network image of somebody. And when someone asks me, for example, do I know someone who works at Sony, I don't just immediately kind of go to my Rolodex and say, well, okay, does anyone here have the, have the, have the title Sony in it, or the company Sony? I think about who is the right person and what is the, the, connect, the network connectivity into the company? What is the, the degrees and strengths of the connections that could provide the right way of solving this challenge? When you see networks, you are network literate. I like the word literacy because it's fundamental. It's a skill that is, that is absolutely critical to how we navigate the world. It, a decade ago, John Battelle, today here in the audience, coined the term search literacy. Namely, those people who could effectively execute a Google search had an edge in, in today's world. This is being literate in the information age. Now, those who can conceptualize and understand networks, both offline and on, have an edge in terms of building a network and a career in today's competitive landscape. This is being literate in the networked age. So what are the four attributes that make someone network literate? First, there's the baseline understanding of new technology. Think of this as network technology. And the technology is important because it makes the, the networks tangible in completely new ways. They were always there, but now they're tangible. Second, there is identity, network identity. Think, you are who you know, but also how they know you, who else do they know, what do they know about you, kind of a, a network coming out from around you. Information is framed by networks, network intelligence. This is a change of perception. What information gives me the edge? What information do I need to know? And fourth, new capabilities because of the network age, or network capabilities. This relates to new parameters of motion, new capabilities. Let's start with network technologies, because this is what makes the networks tangible. Networks have been around as long as people. Aristotle wrote about us as being social animals. We were creatures of the city. And in the theme of today's TED, I think he means both cities 1.0 and 2.0. The technology infrastructure today leverages the age-old human instinct of being social. It's always been big, but now you can see it. Before technology, you had no access to those extended ties. 
For example, we started LinkedIn with 112 invitations from 13 people in Silicon Valley on the first day. Within six weeks, we were at 12,000 people, and over half were outside the US. We started with 12, country, 12 countries in the pull-down tab, and within days, we were adding new countries every day as the network had grown to another country. My own network on LinkedIn is just over 2,600 people, but in the third degree, friends of friends of friends, it's 15 million people. That's a quarter of the people that are in the United Kingdom. That's more people than in Greece or Portugal. People sometimes forget how compounding math works. This network is now visible to you. For the last decade, there's been a lot of discussion of Dunbar's number. Dunbar theorized that we essentially can keep about 150 people, 150 relationships as a number of relationships in our head. My belief is it may be true, but only as a memory cache, RAM as you would. It's the, the people that you can keep in your mind at one time. But with technology, I believe that you, can, you have essentially a hard drive below the RAM and you can maintain a much broader set of connections. And you can already see that, of course, in today's networks. People frequently think about network technology in terms of basic social media, posting status updates and becoming information kind of social media outlets. It's the beginning, but the most profound of these network transformations is how it makes a web of trust. Trust in what to pay attention to, trust in what to believe, trust in how to act. Let's now move on to the second aspect of network literacy, networked identity. People frequently think about professional identity with a few simple tags. Works at company X, has title Y, works in location Z. However, in a networked age, identity is not so simply determined. Your identity is actually multivariate, distributed, and partially out of your control. You are who you know shapes who you are. Let's take the dimensions of my identity. I have the company LinkedIn, my partners at Greylock, our investing business, but also my classmates, people I meet at conferences like TED, people I've just published a book, people I've met through that whole process. Each of these networks, each of the identities and the other people in these networks forms part of my identity. It's a networked age. The brand of you is not just what you broadcast about yourself, but it's what others say about you. It's not just information, it's information within a network. Thinking in terms of network identities informed my invest investing on online social platforms. When I look at network investments, I ask if the product or service could form part of someone's identity. If, if hundreds of millions of people, this would form part of the identity, the fabric by which they connect to other people. Let's take perhaps a non-obvious example. With Zynga, Mark Pincus always intended to build a gaming network. The investment thesis was that Zynga could create a set of games that would become part of how people shared experience with each other, connect with each other. Most people who play Zynga games don't think of themselves as gamers. They think of themselves as having a social experience with their friend. And when they get into it, their farm or their city, and the other people they play games with becomes part of their identity. Facebook, LinkedIn, Last.fm, Flickr, these products all help shape network identity. Hence a key reason I invested. The next, the third part of network literacy is understanding networked information. Information is critical for all professionals, but what's key is having the right information at the right time. If you're network literate, you understand that this information flows within a network. The quantity of information in the world is increasing at an exponential rate. There's more information than anyone can know. It's not just about access to information. Being an expert has less to do with accumulating the most information and more about knowing how to find the right information. And there are lots of instances when search engines don't help you find information. For example, who is the best person to ask advice, to build something, to provide a service, to approach at a company? What should I do this evening with respect to a certain problem? 
Which of these two conflicting pieces of information should I believe? Your network, not Google, not a magazine, is where you get help with these judgment calls. The networked age brings the technologies which help us with this. I'll give two personal examples that show acting on a network of information. First, a reference technique when I'm, when I'm evaluating an entrepreneur. For example, someone has just been proposed as someone I should look at as an investment. I'll identify people who know this person, and I'll drop, the, oh, that also know me, and I'll drop them an email saying, hey, do you know this person, and how do you rate them one to 10? If you get back a lot of sevens, that's a failure. If you get back a bunch of eight and nines, that's really great. If it's below seven, it's a little odd, putting in an email, something that's kind of referentially strange. But maybe it's a really, you know, they have a strong view or they don't care. And if it's above nine, maybe they don't have good judgment. What, <laughs> <laughs> what basically it comes down to is I can now use the network to very quickly get a kind of a radar pulse and get a guide to whether or not of the hundreds of entrepreneurs that I could spend time with this week, that these would be the people to spend time with. And something that's possible now in terms of network information. So we arrive at the fourth and final part of network literacy, network capabilities. When you truly see networks, it changes the way that you plan and strategize. You move differently when you see the networks around you. I'll illustrate with two personal examples. First, venture capital. I don't form a thesis and then go look for entrepreneurs who fit that thesis. I actually position myself in the network and sort of and, and talk to the folks who do the sorts of things that I do so that they bring me interesting companies and interesting entrepreneurs. It's, the style is networked, not informational. I don't put out a listing saying, investments here, please. <laughs> right? it's, it's all about how I live and act within the network. Network literacy is key to the startup of you. Having a robust and varied network helps you as an individual accomplish key tasks in building your career just as an entrepreneur builds their company. You can jump off the, ju the jammed escalator and start moving in your network, and you can navigate this hot, flat, and crowded world with a little help from your friends. Yes, Susan Cain, even an introvert. Network age pre presents many challenges to how we work and thrive, and I hope that you know, governments and stimulus packages and education and immigration, there's all a bunch of things that need to happen. But if you believe, as I do, that the surest way to build the future you want is to empower every individual, I hope that you agree that network literacy and the startup of you is, for everyone is an important way to shape our future. Because the startup of you is both singular and plural of the word you. It is how we build our future as individuals and as the crowd. What does that mean next? Well, that's where we go from here. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. So um, first of all, congratulations on your book, The Startup of You. It just Thank came you. out. I know that. And so a question for you. So it's easy for us and this for people like you and me and many of the people here to get quite exhilarated by the networked <laughs> world and the potential of it. But it's also important to look at some of the unintended consequences. <laughs> and there's some really interesting and important debates going on right now <laughs> about privacy. What does it mean that so many companies can know so deeply <laughs> about our lives? How do you think about that, the, the flip side or yep. the dark side of the network world? Well, I think the key thing is uh, there's lots of different perspectives. There's individual, there's a the company, there's the government. The key thing is to make sure, w when, when it's framed to us mm -hmm. as, oh, there's this thing happening with information, you don't know what it is, it's always scary on right. that framing, right? Ah. <laughs> right? However, when it's like, oh, this is how this service is being provided to you, or this is what you're getting from it, and this is how you're interacting with it, and you have mm -hmm. a certain amount of transparency and openness about it, mm -hmm. it's a lot less scary. And if you see, actually, decade by decade, our notion about what's okay with privacy shifts, it moves. Right. Because we go, oh, that's okay, and that's not scary. And that's, the, that's how we chart through. And the key thing for all three of these perspectives is to make sure that we continue doing the innovation, realizing that the line will move to what's good for us. Mm -hmm. 
And would you have any specific recommendations either for people who run companies who are making a lot of these decisions about what we're doing? With Actually, let's start with that. Do you have any, <laughs> anything to say to the people who run companies who are collecting quite a lot of data about each well, of us? Um, How should they be behaving the, thinking the about it? The rule that we use internally that we started very early at LinkedIn was and we obviously have a bunch of like, you know, uh, plans in terms of building features and everything else. But if you can't publish what we're doing on the front page of the New York Times and hold up your head with your friends, don't do it. It's a good guideline. <laughs> I like it. What about for the individual? For the individual, I Who think it is going, ah, <laughs> scary data. Um, well, for the individual, I think it's one of those things where do you trust? You, you have to figure out, do you trust the services? And you know, part of what um, there's at least a commercial alignment of interest, because services get punished. If they, if they cross the line, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Yes. Um, and so I think it comes down to you know, making sure that you have a sense of what's going on. Um, and that also, you know, in terms of which space you're in, is, is there likely to be something uh, threatening about this data? So for example, your location data, a little scary in some circumstances. Which movies you like? Eh, whatever. Eh. <laughs> we can live with yes, that. Exactly. All right, Reid Hoffman, thank you so much. Thank you. What a delight.